Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to class seven of the Johara Tawheed. We've been moving through, alhamdulillah, we're about halfway through. And um, we're now coming on to some of the, we talked about last time about some of the Rasuliyat, some of the beliefs connected to the messengers and what we believe with respect to the messengers and specifically our own messenger, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we've got a little bit more connected to that before we actually go on to the Sahaba, the people gathered around the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says, Bil mu'jizati. So before we start, I'll just um, remind ourselves that the things that he's mentioning here with respect to the messengers, this is all part of our belief. Everything that we're going through here is the things that a Muslim should believe. Even some of these things about who is better than who and so on and so forth. Yeah. This is part of our belief system as Muslims. And it's indeed how we know that we're getting our deen from sources that are pure in the right way. Each link being, being pure is important for us to know. Otherwise, how would we trust what we get? So when it comes to the Sahaba, it's very important to realize this, that we stress this about the people around the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, even though none of them receive revelation, because they are the connection between us and the Rasul. So line 68, we reached. Bil mu'jizati. أَيِّدُوا تَكَرُّمًا وَعِسْمَةَ الْبَارِي لِكُلِّنْ حَتْمًا بِالْمُعْجِزَاتِ أَيِّدُوا تَكَرُّمًا So mu'jizat, this is what we've been talking about, the messengers and our own messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the things that messengers have is something that's called mu'jizat, literally things which render others incapable of in the face of them. They are not capable of replicating them. They are not capable of doing something the like of that. They have, they have no response. They're rendered dumbfounded. So he says here, by these things, by these mu'jizat, which are events which break the natural order of things. Um, and they are these, when they, when it's referring to this particular form of mu'jizat, it is in response to a challenge. Usually one of them, for example, would come and say, we don't believe that you are who you say you are. Show us that you're speaking the truth. And then the, mirac the miraculous thing would happen. They're not always of that nature, as we're going to come to later. Some of these mu'jizat are sim simply spontaneous miracles. But there are specific ones which are at a challenge. Some of that is in response in the Quran, for example, when the, uh, the Jews came and asked the Messenger of Allah about certain stories of theirs that they kept tight to them. They, they thought we're the only ones who know about the reality of these stories. There's no way he could know about this. This is in our innermost secret books. And then you have Surah Al-Kahf, the, the, the Surah of the Cave that was revealed, which gave them everything that they recognized in those stories with an addition that they didn't even know about themselves. But the addition was one that they recognized was true from what they knew of the stories. So, I mean, that's one of the examples of the, of the Qur'an being miraculous, for example, and it, in response to a challenge. And there's another miracle we come to when um, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu was challenged and he split the moon at a challenge. And when they saw it, as we're going to come to, they still wouldn't believe it, calling it magic and so on. So this is a mu'ajin. But the Surah al the things they didn't know wasn't the, the number. Well, yeah, like the, the the number of people in the cave was was one of the things. But there were each each of those each of the stories in there. Um, there were elements that they didn't fully know about, and there were elements that they did. But they recognized them as the same stories, and they recognized that those elements made sense in what in regard to what they knew of the stories. So they were completely dumbfounded that they, the, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi knew about these things, and they realized he had to be speaking the truth. But there are lots of miracles of this sort. That's the, that's the point. And what is a miracle? Miracle is basically like a letter of recommendation. It's like a passport. <laughs> you come and you show it. <laughs> well, you, you, you want to pass through. They, they want to know that you're, you, you are who you say you are. So they look at your passport. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Off, off you go. In the past, instead of passports, people would have letter of recommendations. 
they would come from one place to another. They would have the official seal on this. They'd hand over, okay, all right, you're a merchant coming from da da da, and they've given you passage. Okay, off you go. Um, this is a, basically a letter of recommendation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's breaking the natural order of things, things that wouldn't be possible. They, were, they couldn't be explained scientifically or in any other way. And yet here it was happening. I mean, fire not burning Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam, for example. Another example of, of this happening, or all of these various different types of things that there's no logical explanation for according to the rules by which this world normally operates. But as we all know from the Ilahiyat, those things only happen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them happen. He is the one who creates effects and creates action. There's no actual thing of cause and effect. But he does get, he does have this world run in a particular way. And he doesn't just upset that natural order of things for anybody. So when he does, and when it's at the behest of a challenge, it's basically him saying, this guy, this slave of mine is speaking the truth. And it's also a takarrum. It's also a way of elevating that person, no, giving him nobility, you know, uh, honoring him. I mean, yeah. not just anybody is going to be able to do these things. You have lesser ones that also honor awliya. Karamat, as they call, they have the similar thing. You know, they are an indication that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is pleased with that slave, and gives them something that other slaves do not have access to. Wa isma This word isma is something you might have heard. The ma'asum. You might have heard it in Shi'i circles. They talk about the imams of theirs being ma'asum. You heard that before? Ma'asum. Ma'asum means completely protected from wrong action. Now, we mentioned this before when we talked about amana as being one of the necessary qualities of the prophets. It's being repeated here because of what he mentioned here of, the, of, of, of takarrum, of honoring them. So, this isma is not just a necessary thing for them, it's also a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's honoring of those slaves, that he makes them impervious or impossible for them to do anything wrong. Is that attribute usually uh, attributed towards the uh, Sahab? No, no, no. This is an attribute that only the prophets and the messengers have. And it's necessary for them to have this attribute because everything that they do is something that we are commanded to emulate and follow. So if they were to do something wrong, as we said last, last week, we would also be commanded to do that. And as things are only wrong because Allah has commanded them, them not to be done, and things are right because Allah has, has commanded them to be done, the fact that they did it will automatically make it right and good. So it's actually impossible. It's a logical impossibility. It doesn't make sense to say something is wrong and then say it was done by them. So the bari is the creator, another word like khalit, ismatul bari, the uh, isma, the protection, him protecting them from wrong. Um, Al-Bari likullin for every single prophet. Every single prophet who has ever lived has been ma'asum. Not just the, the, prophet, the messengers, every prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every single one. It's been impossible for them to do wrong actions. They are the people that we are told to emulate. They are put in front of us as an example for mankind on how you should be in your life. If they were doing wrong action, it would not make any sense whatsoever. If you if you had a role model, and that role model is acting in a way that's you know not good, then where does that leave the rest of us? May I ask uh, with, uh, in the Quran, uh, with regards to Prophet وسلم, when he turned his face away from the blind. Yeah, uh, and the surah was revealed. Was that a wrong action, or was that? No, 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 no. It was not not a, not a wrong action. In fact, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was commanded to bring the deen to the people, and it's well known that if you get the strongest of a people to accept the deen, the rest of the people follow suit. It's human nature that human beings, the weaker human beings, follow the stronger human beings. If you get one man to accept Islam who's strong. A huge number of people follow in his wake. That's just the way things work. 
So as you're involved in in and in the process of doing dawah to somebody, um, you and it's also disrespectful if you're speaking to somebody to 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 interrupt your interrupt your conversation with them and turn away from them. It's most 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 assuredly not a, a wrong action. And so that, that's, that's regardless of the fact that uh, you know messengers don't commit wrong actions. <laughs> If you look at each an individual one that they talk about in the various things, they are not wrong actions at all. None of them. But they are guidances to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this deen is for everybody. And that in fact, at that time, the time was when the weak people, the weaker people were coming into the deen and the strength of Islam was lying in those who were who were not so strong. And those people who he was speaking to, it was not their time yet to become believers, the majority of them. Likullin <laughs> hatman. Hatman means without any doubt, definitively. It's the same, very similar to qat'an. So there, this isma is, belongs to all of them. So a mu'jiz, as I said, is something that relates to messengers. There are other times when things happen, like I mentioned karamat. Sometimes things also happen to people who are enemies of Allah that seem to be on the surface miraculous. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does that to, to, to extend them, to think that they, you know, to further them in their, in, in, in their wrong action. And sometimes it happens the opposite of the way somebody says. So somebody is challenged to prove, like Musaylima, to prove that they are truthful. And they say, okay, I'm going to spit in the eye of this man and he's going to, you know, he's going to be able to, to see again. Because there was a man who was brought to Musaylima who was blind in one eye and could see out of the other. So this man was brought to him and he said, right, I'll spit in his eye and he will be healed. So he spat in the blind eye and then the other eye became blind. Something miraculous, but obviously not in the way that so the natural order of things was overturned but it didn't happen in the in 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 the manner that it was said that it was going to happen so much is not just something that happens that is against the natural order of things but it happens in the same way that the person claims it's going to happen and it happens in response to a challenge and as i said this is a letter of recommendation or a or a proof that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my slave is telling the truth because I'm changing things for him. To be singled out. The best of creation. Now last time we talked about how all of the Muslims, without exception, including the, the the vast majority of all of the even even the vast majority of all the sects agree that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best of creation not just the best human being but the best of everything created better than the angels better than the arsh better than all of the things that have been created he the best of creation was given the honor, um, was singled out, was chosen, that our Lord, Rabbuna, tammama bihil jameel, completed, brought to an end by means of him, everything in terms of his guidance. In other words, the final guidance was brought by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the last of the prophets. After him, no new guidance will come. That doesn't mean people don't have ilham or dreams of that sort, but it means that the guidance, nothing will be changed. This is the final version of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be worshipped. And no one who claims prophethood after him is accepted as a prophet. وَعَمَّمَا And something else that the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had that no other prophet had, Although some people mention Surah uh, Nuh as possibly having it. But the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was sent to all of mankind, not to a specific people. The difference, if you talk about Nuh وسلم, was that 
he was sent to a people and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the flood which killed all the peoples of the time. So his people were the only, the ones who believed in him were the only ones who remained. Um, but with regard to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the agreement of all of the people is that not only was he sent to all of the people of this age and his ummah, but he was sent to all of mankind. It is, it is, it is mentioned that the first ruh created was the ruh of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the alam al arwah, the the world of ruhs, before we entered into this creation, that everybody accepted him as their messenger, including all previous prophets and messengers. And one of one of the proofs of that is that on the night of Isra and Mi'raj, when he went to Jerusalem, he sallallahu alaihi wasallam led all of the prophets in the prayer. So they all accepted him as their imam, as their as as their leader. Um, so he was sent to all of existence, all of them, all of mankind, whether you're from China or whether you're from South America, whether you're from Arabia, all the jinn of the world. And some even say even to the angels, although the angels were already all completely obedient and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of them changed the manner of their worship to, to, to copy the prayer brought by the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa in terms of his form. So it was of the same form that he had. And it refers also to all of the inanimate creatures. I mean, there's many, when we come to the miracles of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi there's many miracles that relate to inanimate objects addressing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi and calling him the Rasul Allah. So they say, based on this, that he was sent to everybody, that in one sense, all of the prophets and messengers that came before the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were almost like deputies sent to somewhere before before the main the the, the, the main messenger comes who who run run the affairs for him until he appears, based on the the the, the hadith that he was his ruh was created first and then the alam al arwah he was the messenger of the prophet of everyone. Bi'thatuhu, oh, so this bi'thatuhu connects to the previous line. Amma ma bi'thatuhu, his bi'tha, his, his uh, message or his sending, being sent, was amma ma, was, was for everybody, was general, was universal. Fashar'uhu la yunsakhu bi ghayrihi, hatta zamanu yunsakhu, his shara. The, the divine law that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam brought, the, the guidance. The guidance brought by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the form of the Quran and in the form of the Sunnah. This will not be abrogated, will not be removed or, or, or set aside. Hatta zamanu yunsakhu, until time itself is removed or is set aside. In other words, until the last day. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's message applies equally every single law that we find in the Book of Allah and in the Sunnah of the Rasul on any matter. That law remains in effect for every human being who comes into contact with that situation until the end of time. If there is a law that dealt with a particular situation and that situation is re replayed identically in, in our time, that law still applies to us. Of course, things change and situations become different, where sometimes you don't find necessarily a law in the Quran and the Sunnah that is identical to the situation that you find yourself in. And that's where you use things like Qiyas, analogy, and so on and so forth. But if there are laws existent for something, they cannot be abrogated, not by another prophet, and not by human beings deciding that they know better and creating their own legal systems and saying our laws are more just now because of the situation has changed and those, those laws were barbaric and only dealt with a particular time and place. No. Those laws are universal for all mankind until zaman, until time, yunsakhu, is done away with, until the last day arrives. And Prophet said, لَن تَزَالَ هَذِهِ الْعُمَّةِ 
qa'imatan ala amrillah this ummah will not cease to be um in place upon or, or acting by the command by the amr the command of allah in other words the deen of truth the commands and prohibitions revealed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la yadurruhum man khalafahum and they can they won't be harmed by those who go against them in other words if they keep to that then no matter what other people do to them they won't truly be harmed this ummah will still be extant will still be existent nothing will cause it to be done away with hatta yati amrullah until the amr of allah the command of allah this time referring to the command for the end of time comes so so long as us we are we are on the amr of allah until the amr of allah we will be safe and nothing really can harm us so as long as our laws are in tune with what Allah has revealed to his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we are acting by those laws we will be safe wa nasakhuhu li shar'i ghayrihi waqa hatman and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's law that he brought the Quran and the sunnah not only can it not be abrogated but it abrogated what came before it the laws that came before it this happened waqa'a hatman without any doubt definitively what does this mean it means that if you are alive in this age after the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent then it is not valid for you to follow any laws that preceded him no matter if those laws were divinely revealed no matter if they were brought by a prophet or a messenger you're not allowed to follow anything because his law abrogated it now though you will find similarities between our law and the laws of the people of of sidna isa and the people of sidna musa yeah many similarities but every part of their law was abrogated and then the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's law came and certain parts of it it replaced made them anew other parts it the law of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the same in other parts it was slightly different all of these things happen but it's a new law you can't expect to be safe if you are following another law apart from his with the intention of following the other law even if it's basically the same wa man yabtaghi ghayra al-islami deenan falan yuqbal min wa huwa fil akhirati min al-khasirin whoever seeks or desires wa man yabtaghi other than islam as a deen it will not be accepted from him and in the next world he will be one of the losers it's a very important thing to realize so it's not the same as the perennialists how will have you believe that so long as you're worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so long as you have tawhid it doesn't matter which prophet you follow you'll be safe because they were all conduits to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the basic position they take but this ignores the fact that in order to follow previous prophets you are either having to to say that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not a prophet so you're denying something that you cannot that cannot be denied as part of your aqidah or you are saying that he was a prophet only sent to the arabs which is again denying what we've just said that his message was universal and for everyone or you're saying that his message was only time specific then you're saying that everybody was left to do their own thing afterwards which again is denying the aspect that he was the khatim and nabiin his seal is the seal on guidance that's the guidance that everybody then has to take from then on so he says here adhallallahu so he makes a dua adhallallahu man lahu mana may allah a base make low um humiliate make them dhalil man lahu mana those who mana who block this or those who say who 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 say the opposite of this those who deny this and uh, this refers as i said to people like perennialists or even those among the jews and the christians who say yeah okay i've heard about islam but my own deen is perfectly fine because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophet isa alayhi salam and and he made 
him a means for people's salvation and guidance. So, so long as I'm following that, I'll be all right. But that, as I said, is a denial of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by taking that position because you're then denying the fact that things change with each time. Yes, there's a difference for people who never hear about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so they're just basing it on what they know of the world. Then they're excused. Or people who do hear about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but all they hear is lies. So they, they're just misinformed. They have no idea about who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was because they've simply been told lies about who he was. By the way, can somebody ask them downstairs to? So within this, within this um, particular verse, he's telling us that uh, the, 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 the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Shar, which was in the form of the Quran mainly, but also his life, abrogated everything that came before it. The prayer of the, of the Christians, we have our own way of praying. The fast of the Christians, we have our own way of fasting. The way of, of sacrificing, the types of things we can eat and the types of things we can drink and so on. They, we have our own particular form. That doesn't mean they won't often mirror what came before, but it is our own shara revealed by the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So ajiz, considered to be permissible, naskha, the abrogation of some of his shara, some of the shara brought by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or bil ba'di, with some, with other parts of it. So this is another principle that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, within his lifetime, and this is part of the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he made it gradual. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to a people who were not even used to Tawheed in the slightest. Everything that he brought was quite alien to them. And they were, they, they, they were people who had certain customs that were ingrained into them and it was difficult for them to let go. And they didn't have any power, so they, they didn't have the thing of seeing it all already being practiced in full or they could then become part of a people where it wasn't the norm among them. You were still living among people for whom a lot of these practices were the norm. For example, alcohol, the drinking of alcohol, which was gradually removed. And there were various other things of that nature. So certain things early on, there was a ruling that allowed them, for, for example, alcohol, and then later on that ruling changed. That doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine shar, his divine law for us changed. It just means that it was unveiled slowly over the course of time, so that its fullness could be understood by the end of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's important also to realize this, that it was complete by the end of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No part of it's missing. It's not that the, the Messenger of Allah was working up towards something and he then passed away uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam before he could actually convey that no everything was complete by the time of his death he conveyed everything it's very important to realize that so the divine law at the death of the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi is the divine law that we should all be following to make positions such as he he was on the way to abolishing slavery or abolishing polygamy or abolishing this or abolishing that um, and the indications are that it was headed in that direction, but it, you know, it just didn't quite happen. It's completely false. So this here means that there are ayats of Quran, because this this nas can, is is usually through uh, nas, which is the div which is the proof by which we know something is part of the of, of the divine law. As I said, this came in the form of sunnah in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi which was what he said and did outside of the Qur'an and what he saw being done by others but didn't call them up about it but let them continue um, and then which was taken from him by other people saying the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said this which is a hadith or the Messenger of Allah did this which is a hadith or other people simply emulating the action of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and doing the same as he did which is called Amal so they didn't transmit it as a belief, they simply did. They simply acted as they saw him acting. So this is Sunnah. Then the other thing is Quran. 
the book of Allah, the kalam Allah, as he as he as he refers to it here. Um, so he says you have to accept that this can be can happen, and there are many ways that this happens. It can happen. Um, the Quran abrogating other ayats of Quran and both of them still being recited. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the um, widow and how long she has to remain in her idda, there's two ayats. وَالَّذِينَ يَتْوَفَوْنَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا وَصِيَةُ لِأَزْوَاجِهِمْ مَتَاعًا إِلَى الْحَوْلِ غَيْرَ إِخْرَاجِ Both these ayats, by the way, are still recited in the Quran, even though one of them is only applicable, one of them is applicable and the other one is not. So this first one, they're both in the same surah, very close to each other, maybe about a page apart, says those whose, whose uh, husbands die, um, or those who die from among you and leave wives, wasiya, a counsel or an instruction, the azwajim to their wives, mata'an ilal hawli ghayra ikhraj, that they should wait for a year without being made to leave their houses. So they should stay in their idda or their period of, of waiting before they can remarry for a year. Yeah, This was revealed in the Quran and is still recited today. But it's not the thing that we practice because there's another ayah shortly after it. In fact, this one is actually recited earlier on in the surah than the one I just mentioned. And this may, it says, those who die among you and leave wives, those wives should wait for four months and 10 days. They should have an idda of four months and 10 days. So from a year to four months and 10 days. Both of these things are mentioned in the Quran and both are recited. What was the reason behind the one year um, age? I'm not sure. But I mean, that was, that was the, both. But the point here is that even though they're both recited, the ruling of one abrogated the ruling of the other. Um, and then there's the, the other forms where Quran is abrogated by Quran, and only the abrogating ayah remains that is recited. And um, then there is the case where Quran, and that's the that's the that's the majority, by the way, where 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 the abrogating ayat remains and, and not the abrogated one. That's the majority. That means that the it's, it's often also that the abrogated thing was part of the the sunnah. And then there is when um, there was something that was recited in the Quran, and then that was abrogated by something which was recited in the Quran, and then that was abrogated itself. This is the um, famous one that uh, we have a difference of opinion between us and the Shafi'is about, which is um, there was an ayah that was originally early recited, Ashru Rabaati Ma'lumatin Yurdi'na, 10 instances of suckling at the breast. Ten suckles of the breast, your di'na makes somebody related by rabaa to somebody else. So this was originally part of the Quran. There was a ruling that if somebody, you know, a man were to suckle from a woman ten times, that that woman then becomes haram for him because she becomes like his mother of rabaa, yeah, a, 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 a milk mother. A wet nurse. That was then abrogated and it became Khamsu Rabaatim Ma'lumat in Yurdi'na, which was also recited in Quran. Five of these uh, sucklings, Yurdi'na, make somebody a wet nurse, which means that you're haram for them. They basically make you like family. And then that was that was abrogated from the Quran in terms of being recited, and according to Imam Malik, in terms of its ruling. So Imam Malik said, this, this doesn't exist amongst us. It doesn't matter how many times you, 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 you breastfeed. If you're, above, if, you're, if you're not a child who needs breastfeeding, then it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't form a family link between you. So if husband and wife do that between each other, it doesn't create a situation where they become haram for each other. Whereas I'm not sure, but one of the other madhabs, I think it's the Shafi'i madhab, I'm not 100% sure, maybe somebody will correct me on this. But um, one of the other madhabs has the position that actually that's still something that has to be avoided because it will. In, in Shafi'i Madhab, although there is the higher prestige for Quran over um, 
But this was this was Quran, and then it was abrogated in terms of not being recited anymore in Quran. And some people kept its ruling alive. Five of sucklings make somebody haram for you through Allah. And Imam Malik said it's no, it does has no effect. So that's another example. Then there are also ayahs of Quran that were abrogated in terms of being read, but their ruling remains. So they're no longer recited as part of Quran, but the ruling contained within them still remains as something that's acted upon. And that's the one reported by Sayyidina Umar. Ashaykhu wa shaykhatu idha zanaya farjumuhuma al-batta nakala min Allah wallahu azizun hakim. A shaykh and a shaykha. To a man who has been married before who or who is married and a woman who has been married before or, or who is married, if they commit fornication, comes adultery in English, if they commit fornication, stone them, absolutely, that's the, that's the ruling, until they're hit. Nakalam min Allah, as a punishment from Allah, Allah is Aziz, Allah is Almighty, Allah is Hakim, all wise. So this ruling actually remains as one of the, as the had punishment for adultery. But it's not part of the Quran that's, that's, that's recited anymore. By the way, all of these types of punishments, zina, you need four witnesses who see the act itself and their, their testimonies all coincide in terms of place and time and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So it's something done in public. <laughs> what was that, uh, the, uh, the Sheikh or Sheikh, that one, was that part of the Quran? Yes. It was reported as being part of the Quran, and then it was removed. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the hadith basically said, we used to recite this in our, in our Quran. And then uh, how was it removed? And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam maybe just indicating that that's not Quran anymore. And then you have Sunnah, which can be abrogated by Quran, such as the, Mus the Muslims originally used to pray towards Jerusalem the Beit al-Maqdis in Jerusalem. And then that was abrogated by the ayahs in the Quran, al-Masjid al-Haram. So now turn your faces to face the Masjid al-Haram, which is the, the, the mosque in Mecca, the Kaaba. So it was abrogated, something that was done in the, by practice by the Muslims because of the Sunnah, then became abrogated by Quran. And Sunnah can also be abrogated by Sunnah, like the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyarat al-kubur, fazuruha. I used to tell you not to visit graves. I used to forbid you from visiting graves. Now visit them. This was a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which indicates that the ruling originally was he had forbidden people from visiting graves, maybe because they were still connected to that worship of the forefather, which was a very, very strong aspect of the, of the pre-Islamic Arab. And then he said, now visit them. Again, they said that's because of the tadkirat remote, the reminder of death that you get from visiting the graves, the reminding of your own fragility. And Quran itself can be abrogated by Sunnah as the... The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ مُوَ إِذَا حَذَرَ أَحَدَكُمْ مَوْتُ إِنْ تَارَكَ خَيْرًا الْوَصِيَّةُ لِلْوَالِدَيْنِ وَلَقْرَبِينَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ حَقًا عَلَى الْمُتَّقِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it has been written for you, it has been made obligatory on you. إِذَا حَذَرَ أَحَدَكُ الْمَوْتُ When death is on the point of reaching you, when you're about to die. Um, إِنْ تَارَكَ خَيْرًا If you have wealth that you will leave. If you have you have a if you have any anything that you're going to leave at the time of your death and it's in your possession, al wasiyatu lil walidaini wal akrabina bil maruf to give a wasiyah to give a bequest to your parents and any relatives that you have bil maruf in a way that is that is good and known. So this was in the Quran. This makes an ayah mentioned in the Quran, but this is not the position that we have. Even though there's no ayat in the Quran that's abrogated this. The position that we have is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said in a hadith, لا وصيت, لا وصيت No one who inherits can also receive a wasiyah, a bequest. Because there's two ways that wealth is passed on in Islam. Wealth is passed on by the 
amounts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down in the Quran, like a sixth, a quarter, or the portions that he's mentioned here, which are for various different peoples, um, a third, a sixth, a quarter, and so on and so forth, or an eighth, or a half, all these various different amounts that are mentioned in the Quran. That's one way that wealth is left. And the second way is what's called wasiyah, which is like a will, when you make a bequest. And you're only allowed to bequeath up to a third of your wealth, and it can only be bequeathed to people who don't otherwise inherit. Those are the general rules about bequests. So that goes against what the ayah is saying. So it's obviously been abrogated by practice, by sunnah. And moreover, an ayah or a ruling cannot be considered to be abrogated unless an alternative is given either in the Quran or the Sunnah to it. So you can't simply say, for example, that jihad has been abrogated because there was no alternative to jihad that was given in the Book of Allah, for example, or slavery has been abrogated or so on and so forth because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give another ayah or another or anything in the Sunnah as an alternative to replace that. Because basically, nusr, abrogation, has two things. One, one thing is moved away and no longer is the case, and something else is then put in its place. So there's the two elements to it. The abrogation of uh, the Quran with the Sunnah, was it done uh, all across all the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the fiqh, across all, all the branches of uh, you know, the Shafi and... Uh, well, this less la wasiyah till worth, as far as I'm aware, is accepted by all of the Muslims. I mean, that if you are an inheritor, I mean, the exception to this particular one is if all of the other inheritors agree. If they all agree, then it's, it's, it's allowed. I mean, another example of that is with, the, with, with spending time with your wives. If you're married to more than one wife, you have to give equal time to each wife. But if all of the wives agree, then they can give up the time to another wife, like with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu when they gave up their time to say to Dina Aisha when he was in his final illness. So she, he could spend his final illness without moving around from house in her house in that particular way. It's the same, it's the same, it's the same thing with La Wasiya. You Wasiya, if all of the inheritors, like there's four children, um, each of them say inherits. So say four boys, each of them getting a quarter. If he says, I want to give a third of my wealth to this particular son before it's all divided up according to the quarters, and they say, okay, that's fine, we agree, every, every one of them, all four of the inheritors, then you can do that. So then that one will get his third plus his quarter of what remains, but only if they all agree. Um, and there is no there is no um lessening. This word ghid means lessening like naqs. It doesn't lessen from the the shara. The divine law is not lessened by the fact that there's abrogation within it. In fact, as I mentioned, it's a hikmah, it's a wisdom of it. It increases it, that it's a, it has a final form, but it reveals aspects of that form as you move along. There's no contradiction in the Quran. The fact, even though there is abrogation, there is the element of gradual of a gradation that's, that's, that's part of it. His miracles, the Messenger of Allah wasallam's miracles are kathira, are many. Almost, almost too many to count. They, they basically became almost a norm for him, in the sense that he would these things would every time somebody was with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi they would often see something miraculous happen. Um, for, for for example, there's the famous one of the um, of the tree trunk in 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 Medina al Munawwara, when the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi had a mimbar built for him. And so he used to just stand on this tree trunk to give his khutbah. And then a purpose-built mimbar was built for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when he went from the tree trunk to go onto the mimbar, everybody in the mosque heard a crying, wailing sound coming from this tree trunk. Everybody heard it. 
I mean, from there it was, and then the messenger of Allah went up to it and hugged it like you hug a child. And it sort of like became like a whimper, like children do when they stop crying. And then it, then it was silent. And the messenger of Allah said to, said to the, the tree trunk, would you prefer that I take you back to the orchard that you originally came from and plant you there and you will have roots and you will become a magnificent tree and give your, give your fruits to the people of this country or that you will give your fruit to the people of the garden and be a tree in the garden. And the people who were sitting near the tree heard the tree respond that it wanted to be one of the trees of the garden. So the messenger of Allah said, I've done that. And then he commanded people to dig a hole under the mimbar, and it was buried there under the mimbar, the tree. So, I mean, this was something that everybody in the mosque heard this. Um, and there's another story where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam picked up a pile of pebbles. And when he put them, his, his hand like that, everybody heard subhanallah the, coming from the pebbles. They were, all of, each pebble was like saying subhanallah, and everybody who was sitting there could hear it. And then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam poured the pebbles into the hand of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and the pebbles all continued to say, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. And they were poured into the hand of Sayyidina Umar and then Sayyidina Uthman. And each time they continued to say, subhanAllah. And then they, and then they were handed over to some people who were, were not of the, of those, the khulafa. And they didn't say anything, <laughs> which is one of the indications of the, Allah, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu was trying to show people the level of the people with him. But it was a miraculous thing that a pebble was saying, subhanAllah. Or Sayyidina Ali radiallahu and mentioned that when he went out in the outskirts of, of Mecca with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherever he walked, every rock that they passed and every tree that they passed said, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. And he heard it. <laughs> I mean, all of these things were, as I said, they were the famous one where the water came forth from the hands of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or he was invited to somebody's house and they had nothing and it fed everybody. All of these things, they were almost commonplace with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but they weren't his greatest miracle. So he mentions here, he says, This word ghurar is, is from a word ghurra, which is the white sort of diamond shaped marking that you see on the forehead of certain horses. That was considered to be a sign of a horse being a magnificent specimen. And from there, it started to be used as something who was magnificent in anything the highest, the best of the best of anything. But here, a further meaning came that something is that is blindingly obvious and blindingly clear. And that's the meaning that's referred to here. These things were, were many and they were so clear that you couldn't fail but see them, basically. they were Because you get the idea of this white thing is blinding light. Um, so that, that's basically the meaning that's referred to here, that they were so, so, so obvious that you'd have to be obtuse to fail to see them the miracles of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Minha, among them was the Kalamullah. Among these was the Kalam, the speech of Allah. And as we mentioned before, the speech of Allah refers to both the speech in terms of his eternal attribute, but it's also used to refer to the Quran itself, even though those words and the sounds are things which are not, you know, eternal, because sounds are created things. Still, that is basically uh, referring to back to the, the meanings, the eternal meanings of the speech of Allah. So that's referring to the Quran itself. So this Quran that the Messenger of Allah brought is his greatest miracle. So you might ask, what's miraculous about it? Well, the Messenger of Allah challenged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged him through the, through the Quran and through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa for anybody to produce anything like it. He says, Qulla in So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, bring forth something that is like it. And nobody did. Then he said, bring forth something which is like a surah of it, like 10 surahs of it. Nobody did. Bring forth a surah like it. And what's the, what's the smallest surah in the Quran? Just three ayahs, basically, really short surah. Still, nobody could replicate even that amount of it. And the last man said, Just say, if all of mankind 
And all of jinn kind, everyone from the beginning of time to the end of time, they all came together for the purpose of bringing something from their own efforts. All of the greatest authors in history, the Shakespeare's and all of these, all of these pre-Islamic poets and um, every one of these guys came together and they had a had big conflap and they would they tried to to work together to produce something like the Quran. He says they would not be able to bring the like of it. Even if they were helping each other to do that, they were sort of analyzing and helping and all this, all of them working together, every single one of the greatest and the, the least great of mankind in, in literature or in meaning or in any field came together for this purpose, they couldn't do it. This thing that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi bought that won't change until the end of creation is his greatest miracle. And it also reported things that he couldn't possibly know, as in those stories. He also, also the, messenger, the, the Quran talks about things that had yet to happen, like uh, the, the, what happened with between the Romans and the Persians at the beginning of Surat the Rum, and the way that that conflict would, would end, who would come out victorious, which had yet hap- not yet happened, and it happened exactly as predicted. All of these various things are aspects of the miraculous nature of the Book of Allah. I mean, there's the story of Labid, who was uh, one of the greatest poets of the Arabs, who the first moment he heard the Quran, never wrote another word of poetry because he knew that nothing he could do could ever match it. And so he spent his time just savoring the Book of Allah. That's all he wanted to hear and all he wanted to say. He just wanted to recite the Book of Allah and hear the Book of Allah and nothing, have nothing else to do with language. Another miracle, which I mentioned, uh, just an interesting story, is the one that mentions the um, splitting of the moon. And that was related by Ibn Nas'ud, radiallahu anhu. He said, وسلم, When we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, or when we were with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the qamar, the moon, was split into two halves in such a way that it looked like one half was about uh, was 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 above the mountain and one half had dropped below the mountain so that you could see them separated um the messenger of allah وسلم, said look um the kuffar of quraish the unbelievers of quraish said this is magic Send somebody to the regions, to some, to some, to some distant town, to see if they saw the same thing that we did um, or not. Because they say, well, well, maybe he's just put something over our eyes. He's, you know, done the tricks of magicians, you know, where they bewitch you by, by what they've said or they hypnotize you or whatever. So they said, okay, all right, go and see if anybody else has seen this because we think he's simply bewitching us. Um, so the people of those distant places affirmed what they had seen. They said, yeah, we saw it split. So the Quraysh said, <laughs> they said, they said, okay, this is a magic that is continuous. The magic is even, even lasting to those. They still wouldn't believe. They still thought it was some sort of bewitching that had even happened beyond their own zone. So, I mean, um, all of these things were miracles that happened to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wajzim bi mi'raj al-Nabiyyi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kama ra'aw. Another miracle of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we all are aware of, is the night journey. Laylat al-Isra wal mi'raj. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam traveled from, it's mentioned in the beginning of, um, of uh, Surah al-Isra. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa. Glory be to him who traveled by night with his slave from the masjid al haram, which is the mosque in Mecca, to the masjid al aqsa, to the furthermost mosque, which is that in Jerusalem. So it's mentioned, it's, a, it's proven by the fact that it's mentioned in the Quran means something we have to all believe in that, that it happened. 
Can you somebody else go and tell these guys? So it's mentioned in the Quran, both the Isra, which is the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, and it happened on the 27th of Rajab, which is about two months to no, it's uh it's, it's one it's about a month before Ramadan. Um and also the second part of the journey, which is the ascent, which was when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam traveled from Earth up through the heavens to Qabi Qawsaini Adna to closer than two bow lengths or nearer, where he went into the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That aspect is also mentioned in the beginning of Surah al Najm. So both these parts of the journey are mentioned in the Quran. Is there a scholarly opinion that the second or second leg was not physical? There's a scholarly opinion among there was a difference of opinion among some people about whether the journey was in uh, in the body, where it was actually the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam traveling, and his he he left Mecca physically and traveled to Jerusalem, and then went up through the heavens physically, or whether it was in ruh, which means that he wasn't sleeping, but his body remained and his spirit did this journey, traveled outside of his body and did the journey, but his body remained where it was, or whether it was it was in his sleep. So that he, he that it was a true dream. The position of the majority of the people is that this was something that was done in body, otherwise Quraysh would not have mocked him for telling him about telling them about it. Because they were, because they said, "How is that possible? No one could travel to Jerusalem in a single night, but anybody could actually dream about traveling to Jerusalem in a single night." They wouldn't have had that reaction, unless it was either he'd either said it was either ruh, i.e., that he'd actually physically traveled as a part of him, his ruh, or that he'd done it in his body. Those the, the sleep option is unlikely given that, although there is there are some who say it is. But the most, because he because he described things along the way that later they they notice a particular caravans arriving at various times and so on and so forth, to to prove to them that what he said was true and these things arrived and they were where they they were there at the time that he said they were in a particular place and so on. When he went to um, Jerusalem, he led the other prophets in prayer, as I said, and also that was when he was given the choice between milk and wine, and he chose milk which is an indication of choosing fitra, what's natural, rather than something which is wine, which has been changed. So the deen of, affirmed that the, the deen that we have is the deen of fitr. Then from there, through the, through the seven heavens where he met various prophets, where he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the prayer was, was revealed in terms of the number of prayers that we have to do each day. And all of that happened on this particular night. And he also on this journey saw various punishments that people who are in the fire are receiving even before they get to the fire in the unseen. <laughs> um, so all of these things happened on that particular journey. The journey itself is accepted by Quran, by Sunnah, and by the ijma of all of the Muslims. All of the Muslims accept that this journey happened. As I said, the only difference is whether it happened in body or in terms of spirit. As for all of the details of this journey, some are strong, more strongly emphasized than others. But the most important thing to remain inside of the deen is to believe that this journey happened. Not necessarily to the level of all the details. Then he says here, the next part of it. And declare or believe to be bari, to be innocent, Aisha, the wife of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of what they accused her of. This is referring to the story which is mentioned in Surah Nur. Most of these stories you'll find, this is why we are talking about them here in terms of belief, because these are all confirmed within the Book of Allah, the Laylatul Isra Miraj and the story of Aisha. So basically when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on any journey, he would draw lots between his wives to decide which wife accompanied him on that journey. These were the various expeditions, whether they were sort of battles or raids or whatever it was. This is to the Banu Mustaliq. So in this particular one, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took Aisha radiallahu anha. And then on the way back, um, she was traveling, by the way, because this was after the, um, 
the ayahs were revealed about the, the wives of the messenger of Allah being behind a hijab, being being not sort of interacting with people in the same way, but were behind a screen. So she traveled in a litter on the back of a camel, which was a covered litter. So she, she'd gotten out because she dropped a necklace to look for this necklace. And the people who were leading her camel thought that she was in there because she was quite light anyway. And so, so they went off and she came back and found that they, the camp, everybody had left camp and that she was left behind. Nobody else was there. So she basically sat down thinking that they'll find out I'm not there and they'll come back. And then she fell asleep. And while she was sleeping, one of the Muslims who had also fallen behind, some say it was because he was a very heavy sleeper who hadn't woken up when the Muslims had left camp. Anyway, this man, Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal, he came by and he saw her there sleeping. So he went past where, where she was. He had his had his his camel kneel beside her. Then, he, So he wouldn't watch her. He went to face his back to her. And then he, he called out to her until she woke up and got on the camel. And then without looking back, when the camel, he led the camel and walked with the camel while she was on there. And then they caught up to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi and the others. And people started to spread the rumor that she was in an affair with this man. And this was mainly spread by the hypocrites and by other Muslims who were easily led astray. And so this, this rumor started to do the rounds. So much so that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it reached his ears and he asked that people rid him of whoever was spreading this, these lies because he said, I know my wife and this is something that she's not capable of. And I know Safwan and this is something that he's not capable of. Um, and so he said these words and then the, the leader of, of Aus, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, said that he would kill anybody of, uh, no, the leader of Khazraj said he would kill anybody from Aus who had done this and he would do with the people of Khazraj if somebody of Khazraj had been spreading this in the manner of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw fit. And one of the people of Aus was there and he said, no, 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 you can't kill our people. And they were about to declare war on each other as a result of these rumors. This almost, because because historically Aus and Khazraj had been at war for, these were two of the main tribes of Medina, had been basically killing each other for, for hundreds of years. <laughs> when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came and they finally became the Ansar. They joined together to be the people of Medina. But there was still some underlying tensions and this threatened to erupt those tensions and rip them open again until the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them not to do this. And then the ayats were revealed about this. Um, and the ayats also were revealed declaring the innocence of Sayyidatina Aisha, saying it was a buhtanun azim, a lie, a, hu a huge lie that was declared against her. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared her innocent in his, in his book. So we are required to believe in the innocence of Aisha. Um, so just a quick little bit more, because uh, we're, I said we'd touch on the Sahaba. So he says, وَصَحْبُهُ خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ فَاسْتَمِعَ and his Sahaba, the people who gathered around him, the people who accompanied him. And to be a Sahabi, he didn't have to spend a long time in the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi It was enough to see him or interact with him and believe in him in your lifetime. Yeah? You couldn't be a Sahabi if you, if you spent time in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi but didn't believe in him or you spent time with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi before he became a prophet, and then didn't spend any time with him after he became a prophet. You had to spend time in the company of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was a prophet and believe in him. That was the basic condition of it. So somebody like Abu Jahl obviously spent a lot of time with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but never believed in him as a prophet. Simply thought of him as Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad the son of Abdullah. So he obviously is not a Sahabi. Other people heard about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but never came to see him. Like Uwais ibn al-Qarni al and so on. That he's considered to be the best of the Tabi'in. But he's not considered to be a Sahabi as a result of not seeing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi and believing in him. When he, you know. So that's that you have to have spent time with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi It doesn't necessarily also mean seen. Obviously, somebody who's blind can't see the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi but he's still considered to be a Sahabi. 
but there is that aspect of spending time so for most people that will be seeing but for us for a blind person that could be hearing in the time of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are the khairul qurun the best of generations and this is um the reason we say this is for a number of reasons it's a necessary belief to us for two reasons one the fact that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself told us on numerous occasions that they were the best of his people he said, for example, the best of generations is my generation, then the people who follow after them, and then the people who follow after them, or then the Qarn, the generation that follows after them. And um, he made dua for his for his sahabis, Allah, Allah, fi ashabi, and, and in a particular hadith, he refers to their excellent quality. And another hadith, he says, in Allah akhtara ashabi, Allah chose my ashab, ala over all the worlds apart from the prophets and the messengers so also there's the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was sending the best of his creation the one who he loved the most and he's going to put him among the people who are a terrible group of people no he promised to preserve this deen and he will put the messenger of Allah amongst the, the, the people who he befit him because we all we judge a person by the company he keeps and you know you can tell a lot about a person by the people who spend company with him so if you take this position like the Shia that he gathered around a people 99.99 percent of whom were all deviants and only the only a, only a handful were, or 12 or whatever they say were on the right path what are they saying about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He was the, the people who gathered around him were all this type of person. Makes no sense whatsoever. And also, there is the reality: if you ever spend time in a, with people, especially people of high worth um, or people of wilaya of closeness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, just by sitting in their company, you feel changed. You become changed. It's, it's, impo it's impossible not to be if you have any sincerity or any love for Allah and His Messenger. That if you spend time with the best of people, something of them doesn't rub off on you by osmosis, simply by being in their company. Who did these people spend time in the company of? <laughs> the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whoever spends time in his company would have to be changed purely by who he was. It's impossible that they couldn't be. And we're changed by people who've, who've taken on a portion of his light. Imagine the totality of that light. They would be illuminated beyond measure. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat in nas. Talking to us as an ummah, but also then that would refer most to the people of the first ummah who to hear this, which was the Sahaba. You are the best ummah, the best people, the best community. Ukhrijat in nas, that have to have ever been set forth among people so if they were the best if this is the best ummah and they were the best of this ummah then it follows that they are the best of people besides the prophets and the messengers who as we mentioned before have a special station that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them for that no, nobody else can hope to reach Pastamir, he says so listen up simply because of the line of poetry needed another word <laughs> so he tells us so listen Fatabi'i, then the next one, fa, this word fa is an indication of immediately following on. So it means that if you said thumma tabi'i, there could be a huge difference in terms of quality between the previous and the next. But fa indicates that they're very close to the Sahaba in terms of their worth. They're very, very close. But as a whole, the tabi'in were not at the same level quite as the Sahaba. And the best of them were not at this, quite at the same level as the best of the Sahaba. We also know from the khutbah Hajj of the Sabah was giving the other day that when he talks in Surah Al-Waqiyah, thullatun min al-awwaleen wa qaleelun min al-akhirin, about the sabiqun, about the muqarrabun, those brought close, those who, we're going to talk about sabiqun in a few lines. Those people, there was a thulla, a large amount of them in the awwaleen, in the first peoples. And only a small amount in the later peoples. That's another indication that the earlier you go, and there's a difference of opinion about this, whether it's simply the first three generations, because he says, 
And then the tabi'un liman taba, the next generation, the followers of those who followed. A follower, by the way, is somebody who interacted with a Sahabi in the same way that a Sahabi interacted with the Prophet and believed. So that's a tabi. The best of the tabi'in, as I said, is said to be Awais al Qarni. And among the Muslims, Hafsa bin Sirin is considered to be one of the best of the tabi'in. Um, so then the next generation is the tabi'i tabi'in, amongst whom were Imam Malik and people of his ilk. So they're the followers of the followers. These are the first three generations. When we talk about the Amul Ahl Medina, the practice of the people of Medina, it is referring to what was done by those three generations, not by late, later peoples. Because these people, fa again, are very, very close in terms of their level of quality. So the difference of opinion is, what if you get to somebody who met one of the tabi'at tabi'in? Are they just a little bit less and a little bit less and it keeps on going in that so that eventually, you know, uh, you know, people are just getting slightly worse and worse and worse over time? Or is it simply those three generations are, are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised them up and then everyone after that can be great or can be less good without any particular generation being better than any other. And there's a difference of opinion about that. Based on hadith of the Messenger of Allah, which some seem, which indicate that it goes, for example, there's a hadith, ma min yawmin illa walladhi ba'dahu sharrun min. There's no day that passes except that the one that comes after it is worse than it. <laughs> That's talking about days again. And that could be an indication, though, that things get worse and harder for people, not necessarily an indication of the quality of the people. And then there's مَثَلُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ مَثَلُ الْمَطَرْ لَا يَذْرِي أَوَّلُهُ خَيْرٌ أَمْ آخِرُ So the likeness of this generation is like rain. You don't know which part of the rainstorm that's, that's come will bring good, or which part of it will, whether the first of the, the first rains will bring the best results, or the last of the rains will be what brings the best for, for the land, basically. So there was that other hadith which indicates that there's no real differentiation after the first three between the first people, the closest peoples, or the later peoples. One of the signs of the Yom is that, you know, this would be like fraud and, uh, you know. Yeah, so I'm saying that they, they, there are people who say that uh, after the first generation, three generations were basically already in the end, end times anyway. I mean, there's been many times in the past where people have thought that the final day had arrived. Yeah, Jews and my Jews, you know, when the Mongols came and destroyed Baghdad and went on a wave of conquering, destroying the Muslims, that the Muslims were convinced that this was the final day until a group of Muslims came and defeated them. This is why even if you see all of the signs of the last day, you cannot stop because it happens in waves until the final signs happen. So we have to continue to act as if everything is remedial. We don't, we can't wait for somebody to give us the answers like a Mahdi or anything like that. We have to act as if everything can be changed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change it through us at any time. We don't know exactly when the Sa'a will come, we just know it's close. But whether, whether our generation is worse than the previous generation or on a par with it is the difference of Allah knows best. Okay, I'll do one. I think I'll do a couple more lines here. The best of them are those who were given the khilafa, who took on the khilafa. The best of the Sahaba, you have the best of them in terms of individuals. Um, he says here, they amruhum fid fadli kal khilafa. So when it comes to their excellence, it's also to do with the order in which they took up the khilafa. So the best of this ummah after the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by the way, here, when he says wulli al khilafa, it's only talking about the khulafa rashidun. I mean, even Muawiyah, who was the who was the Khalifa after the period of the Khulafa Rashidun, said, "Ana awwalul muluk." I'm the first of the kings, because there was a, a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu which was well known that Khilafa would be for thirty years. And when you look, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiAllahu an basically was the Khilaf, was the Khalifa for two and a half years, and Sayyidina then. Then Sayyidina Umar, who was the next Khalifa, Ibn al-Khattab radiAllahu an, was Khalifa for 
10 years and a half or something of that nature. And then Sayyidina, um, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anh, was Khalifa for about 12 years. And then Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh, was, Khalifa, was Khalifa for about four and a half to five years. So when you added up all of the times that they were Khalifas, then they've got it down to the day. <laughs> um, it comes to 29 years and six months. And after that, Al, -Al, -Al Hassan, and the son of, of, of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he was Khalifa for about six months before he passed it on to Muawiyah. So, which brings up the end of the 30 year period. So, they were talking about when they're talking, but when they're talking about the four, the Khalifa of Russia, and they're only talking about those first four. And so, basically, it means that Sayyidina Abu Bakr was the greatest of them, followed by Sayyidina Umar, and followed by Sayyidina Uthman, followed by Sayyidina Ali. There is a difference of opinion among some of the early scholars, including Imam Malik, who originally held the position that Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh, was better than Sayyidina Uthman. There was a difference of opinion. He changed his mind. So he held that position for a while, and then he reversed it and went back to the position of the majority that Sayyidina Uthman has a superiority in terms of rank to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh. So that's basically the position with regard to the Khalifas among the Muslims. Anyway, we'll, we'll finish there, inshallah. Is there any questions? Bismillah wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nista'in. Iyadina s-sirat al-mustaqim. S-sirat al-ladhina namta alayhim ghayl magdubi alayhim wa ladhalin. Ameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad bin Abdika wa Rasulika al-Nabiyyil mi wa'ala. Alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim taslima. Subhanu rabbika rabbil azati ma isfum. Assalamu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum.